All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the series of videos on great ideas in psychology. This is part 14, based on chapter 14 of Professor Fatali Mogadam's book with the same title. And in this part, we are talking about the self, the concept of the self, its place in psychology, its importance, why the self is an important idea. So we should begin by noting that this is not a very popular topic in psychology. In fact, psychologists do not usually pay attention to the self, and it is worth asking why. I believe that if you spend enough time thinking about this question, if you spend enough time thinking about the concept of the self, you will realize the connection between psychology and other disciplines like philosophy, phenomenology, political theory, and you will soon realize that for psychology to really be a worthwhile discipline, to, for psychology to be radically psychology, not superficial, not a superficial um, survey or a network of concepts that only have a superficial relevance to human life, it has to be more than that academic discipline of psychology. It has to be more. It has to be essentially um, political, phenomenological, and philosophical. And the notion of the self is one of those things that create more easily, create a bridge between psychology and a philosophical uh, investigation into psychologically relevant areas. We are going to talk about some of the perspectives on the self, including these three, the three schools, how they approached the self. And then we want to talk about uh, two different ways of handling the self. One has to do with knowing and perceiving the self, so self-perception. This is uh, focusing on how we understand ourselves, self-perception. But uh, we don't just know ourselves, think about ourselves and judge ourselves. We also do something else. That is, we perform ourselves. So this is the other, another aspect relevant to the notion of the self, and that is self-presentation. So there are lots of branches that um, we can go on when we start thinking about this central concept of the self. There is a figure in the history of psychology, extremely important, central figure, and at the same time that he is central, he's also exceptional in many ways he represents an exception, a person who didn't see a clear boundary between philosophy and psychology. That is William James. In the Principles of Psychology, he devoted a discussion to this concept of the self, and he is one of the very few psychologists who has discussed this topic. One of the things that he did was Distinguished, he distinguished between different senses of this concept, different senses of the term self. So he said that a person, when the person refers to themselves, they might mean different things. So yeah, this self has different facets. You can think about yourself as a physical being, as a mental or psychological being with an inner life, inner subjective life, private experience. You can think about yourself as a social being, having a social self, a cultural self, a spiritual self, maybe a religious self. And in each one of those, you, you enter into relationship with a different set of realities. So as a physical self, you are in relation to things like gravity and obstacles and different substances. As a social self, you are in relationship with different, with other beings, like other human beings, your family members, as a spiritual or religious self, you enter into relationship with divine beings, and so on and so forth. So this Jamesian way of thinking about the self continues in, in the works of contemporary thinkers, con contemporary psychologists. For example, Rom Hare, who passed away recently, has this uh, set of volumes about psychology, and each volume, as the title suggests, is devoted to an aspect of the self. So 
one is called the phys uh, is called physical being so the physical facet of being a person having a self that is physical uh, another volume is called social being and another one was titled personal being so this is you can see that as a continuation of a jamesian tradition then we have psychoanalysis and um, represented by people like sigmund freud and carl jung so they also suggest ways of thinking about ourselves so this is just one example and uh, one example that i'm bringing in to show how people um, talk about the being uh, of individuals and the reference to self is unavoidable you can't avoid discussing the self for example some psychoanalysts will say in civilized society we cannot express everything about who we are parts of ourselves therefore are repressed they are hidden they are denied they are ignored so you are in a social setting you're in a civilized uh, part of society you're a member of a civilized society and because of that there are parts of yourselves that you feel like you might not um, express and that you might not even afford to think about those parts even in your private experience you might not think about them and that just comes with the social context so this is how do we then refer to those aspects of your being that you are not expressing that you are repressing those are also part of yourself so the notion of self is something that can combine both those parts that are expressed and those parts that are not expressed um then continuing that somebody like carl jung would say parts of ourselves which could be expressed in archetypes are hidden from ourselves so these parts are denied you might be unaware of them you might not be aware that there is for example um parts of you that are expressed in the form of a magician or magical qualities or alchemical desires or al alchemical image imagery uh, but you're attracted attracted to those ways of thinking to those images when you see them outside of yourself so carl jung said that the way we approach things outside of us the way we feel repelled or attracted to things outside of us are also clues they, they provide clues about ourselves um, the distinction also between ego and the unconscious for freud or ego and the self for jung is um, is relevant here ego is the conscious part of the psyche uh, both for freud and jung and they contrasted that uh, ego the conscious ego with the unconscious or the self the self is a larger whole only part of that is conscious available to the conscious mind now you might get it get the image based on these discussions of uh, freud and jung that the self is just you your body it's a private isolated um, element away from other people and then enters into relationship with other people but that was corrected in, when people responded um, to these formulations one of freud's um, followers harry solomon and he emphasized the uh, relationships. So Sullivan emphasized the role of relationships in the formation of self. So a self is something that is achieved, something that arises out of our interactions. So Sullivan said that maladaptive mal behavior arises from interpersonal relationships that lack necessary ingredients like love, support. And because of the lack, because of those lacks, um, we experience anxiety so anxiety is something that uh, is a product of the relationships that we have there's certain kinds of anxiety not anxiety as such to, to reformulate harry sullivan's idea we can say problems of the personal self the things that you might experience in the privacy of your mind problems of the personal self reflect problems of the social self even though we might not be aware of these problems as problems of the social self. But that social self has primacy. What was one of the main factors why the self was neglected for many years was the dominance of behaviorism, especially in the United States between 19, 
uh, around 1910s to 1960s. Um, and even when cognitive psychology became dominant and it seemed like we, uh, that uh, discipline of psychology or academic psychology overcame the dominance and biases of behaviorism, they didn't really because the methods, methodological principles and methodolog uh, or methodical commitments of behaviorism persisted in the work of cognitive psychologists, which is why experience, the mind, the self were excluded from both behavioristic psychology and cognitive psychology. In cognitive psychology, it is quite unusual and rare to ask research participants about their experience, to reflect on the kind of self that uh, they are presenting or understanding of themselves. So uh, B.F. Skinner notably compared the concepts of the self to religious concepts like God that we need to outgrow. And he argued that we should abandon these as old uh, fictions that are no longer useful. In contrast to behaviorism, there is a movement that is still alive, although it is uh, marginal, re relatively speaking, on the margins of academic psychology, and that is the humanistic movements represented by uh, many people, uh, including Gordon Alpert, uh, Abraham Maslow, Carl Rogers, Adrian Van Kam, and Amadio Giorgi. I mean, I said many people, but they are not that many compared to people who are in cognitive psychology and cognitive science. Uh, but they are, uh, there are some people in this, um, in this movement, in this tradition of humanistic psychology, and some of them are still working and still in academia. Uh, in contrast to behaviorism, a humanistic psychology emphasizes the process of becoming in a person and the actualization of the self, the actualization of what is potentially uh, existent in the self. So you might have, uh, you might already be familiar with the phrase self-actualization that is connected with the humanistic movement in psychology. So rather than what the person is, like what personality traits they have. Uh, humanistic psychologists try to talk about first, a process of a person becoming something, not being something fixed and unchanged. And second, they also uh, focus on the relationships that the person enters into because relationships are also quite dynamic. Relationships themselves are also in the process of becoming an actualization. And, uh, Maslow, for example, in, uh, in his discussion of actualization, he talked about a person moving from relatively lower level needs to higher level needs. Uh, Carl Rogers, another humanistic psychologist, talked about the inner processes, like this, the, the, the process of development and actualization being governed by the self. There's an inner aim. There's an intrinsic aim and drive towards growth and development in the in the within the person. You don't need to push or guide the person from outside or dictate uh, how they should develop. Our author, Professor Mogadam, talks about the social factors, social movements, uh, just at the time that behaviorism was in decline, um, like feminism, gay rights movements, minority rights movements. Uh, and these are associated with shifting focus towards respecting and um, recognizing the dignity of personal and collective selves, personal and collective identities. There was also a self-esteem movement in the US that was later, like in our time, uh, it is heavily criticized by people like Roy Baumeister and others, because they argue that the self-esteem movement tends to go too far. You can think about this, it might be beyond the scope of our present discussion. Um, you can think about why is it that self-esteem uh, is problematic? Why is it that self-esteem could go too far or emphasizing it too much might be harmful? To put it briefly, the problem is that something like self-esteem has to remain in touch with reality. So the way you esteem yourself, the way you have, you have high self-regard should not be out of touch with the facts of your life, with what you take to be true about you, about yourself. And 
the harmful aspect of that movement uh, or the um, the way it can go too far has to do with sacrificing that reality, sacrificing that relationship with the truth. All right, let's move to the sense of self or the experience of the self. And this also has multiple sides. You can think about yourself as a subject, as an I, as a source of agency, as a source of change, or you can think about yourself as an object, um, as a me rather than an I. With regard to an event or with regard to a body part or an object, a tool, something that belongs to you, you might feel to be an agent or an owner, you might feel ownership over your actions, your body, your belongings to a history, you can say, I did that, that is mine. Or you can feel yourself to be as an, an object. You can talk about yourself as object of other people's actions, saying things like they arrested me, they judged me, the doctors operated on me. And that's a different way of having a sense of self. Um, now, I haven't had much chance to go through these uh, long videos of the, the trial involving uh, Johnny Depp and that's other woman's name, I forgot. Um, is it Heather something? Amber, Amber Heard? Yeah. Uh, so if you listen to one of the things that you can pay attention to in, that, in these um, court sessions is the way they refer to themselves sometimes as an agent, sometimes as patients or objects. Uh, sometimes they say that, she or he did that to me. I had no control over this. So when, for example, Johnny Depp talks about his um, addiction, it, he that's a really confusing gray area. Uh, is he taking responsibility? How much responsibility is he taking for the decisions that he made uh, when he was in pain, when he had to take drugs and he knew taking drugs would not lead to uh, good consequences, but he would nonetheless do, do those things. So you can sensitize yourself, paying attention to the way people think about themselves, different senses of the self, self as subject, self as object, ownership, agency, responsibility. A related concept here uh, having to do with self-perception is uh, the term the, uh, or the concept looking glass self. This term was coined by Charles Cooley, and it refers to the fact that our self-understanding, the way we understand ourselves, depends on how others understand us. It is really important to nurture good relationships with other people and try to strive for um, having good relationships because it is not just a behavior that changes in the context of those relationships, but our identities change. If you are in, the, in relationship, in contact with someone who gives you negative feedback consistently, regardless of what you do, that changes your self-understanding. Um, even if you resist that to some degree, it's going to affect you. Uh, related to the looking glass self, uh, we have George Herbert Mead, uh, who also argued that self-perception arises out of social interactions by focusing on what he referred to as the significant symbols, actions, and words children learn in order to elicit the desired behavior from others. So for example, imagine a child who uh, is using the toys as uh, imagined students in a classroom, and she is pretending to be a teacher. So these are, you can think about children who role play pretending to be teachers, pretending to be doctors, pretending to be nurses um, or chefs, you know, they, they take on these roles, these uh, symbolic roles, like they're looking uh, at, you know, pretending that they are teaching some students, you know, using the dolls as imagined students there, or using the dolls as imagined patients, you know, pretending to be a doctor. Um, that context, these roles are significant symbols and children, experiment with these rules, experiment with these um, occupying these positions in relation to other people. Moving from individual scale to the social scale, uh, from interpersonal relationships to intergroup relationships, uh, we can also think about how a minority group might perceive themselves as less important or less worthy compared to the majority because of the way they are 
being judged or because of the way they perceive themselves as being judged by the majority of the people. One person who you've probably heard of, Leon Fetzinger, who's Festinger, who is associated with cognitive dissonance theory, he also discussed the role of social comparison. So how this is the idea that the way you think about yourself arises out of your comparison, the way you compare yourself with other people. Now we move from understanding to performing or self-perception to self-presentation. There are strategies that we explicitly or implicitly without knowing sometimes uh, we adopt these strategies when we enter into a scenario. So imagine the scenario of entering into a group. There's a, there's a person who joins a group for the first time. Edward Jones identified these strategies as possible acts. When you join a, a group for the first time, you want to introduce yourself, present yourself, the kind of person you are. So uh, for example, ingratiation, you give a compliment to someone. You probably have noticed two people meeting for the first time. One of them gives a compliment uh, to, to the person. That's a way of self-presenting, saying that I'm paying attention to your, your bag or your shoes. Intimidation is, it belongs to the same category of self-presentation acts, self-promotion, exemplification, supplication. You can read, uh, if you want, you're interested in more detail, you can refer to the textbook. Irving Goffman. We should also uh, mention him, very important person in this, uh, in this area. Our author writes that Goffman explored the ways in which all of us are performers on the giant stage of everyday life. He distinguished different parts of this giant stage. So there are, for example, parts of life or areas in, in our lives that, are, that seem less uh, formal. And it seems like we are not in the front stage. So for example, you're talking to your friend right before a job interview and you're practicing your job interview. You're talking about uh, what your plans are in the next five, 10 years, but you're talking to your friend, even though you are still performing, you're still presenting yourself, but the way you're presenting yourself to your friend before the interview has the character of a rehearsal. And it, feels as if you are in the backstage. And then you go into the interview. Now the stakes are high. There are actually stakes. You can lose or win the interview. You can get accepted or rejected. And that is uh, what Goffman refers to as the front stage, when you are more committed to that role, that you are, you're not experimenting as much anymore. How do we know when we are in the backstage or the front stage? How, how do we know which role we should perform and which roles we should, we should forget for the time being? Uh, because we all have multiple roles that we can activate and body. So we rely on the environment. We rely on the cues that we receive from other people. We rely on others to know when to perform which role, what stage, and what scenario. Related to this topic, and these material are not discussed as much in this chapter, uh, we have uh, concepts like the actual self versus the ideal self. Like think about if you have an ideal self, do you have an ideal self? Is it useful to have an ideal self? Where do you get your ideal self from? Is that your conscience? Is that the super ego? To what degree is your ideal self yours? Is that really yours? Did you come up with that ideal self or did you inherit it from your cultural context? Did you learn uh, to value one kind of being uh, that is different from you more than? with what you actually are. Is there a relationship between the ideal self and self-esteem or self-respect? Having an ideal self, does that reduce your, the, the way you value yourself, the way you respect yourself, the way you celebrate your life? Or does it, is, is that a source of negative feeling? So these are worthwhile questions to think about. Let me end with a passage from um, A Twilight of the, of the Idols. The point here is to show you there are different ways of thinking about the self. There are ways of thinking about the self uh, that involve radical acceptance of self as a piece of destiny. So Nietzsche wrote, the individual in his antecedents and in his consequence is a piece of fate, a piece of fate, an added law. So rather than 
submitting to an external law, you can think about that self as itself a law that is added to the world, an added necessity for all that now takes place and will take place in the future. To say to him or to her, or to them, to say to them, alter yourself, is to require everything to alter itself even backward. So this is a radical acceptance that is more in line with the humanistic psychology movement. All right, let's pause here. Um, we will continue next time with chapter 15, which is conformity to group norms. If you like this series, again, please support the channel by liking, commenting, subscribing. And if you are thinking about a more serious relationship with the channel with my, my Sunday reading groups, discussion groups, feel free to check out my Patreon page. And that's it for now. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. And I will speak with you in the next part.